If you will, take your Bibles and open them to the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 18, and we are in verse 18. We'll be reading Luke 18, uh, verse 18 through verse 30 as we continue uh, this series, uh, the exposition of the Gospel of Luke. I have on a number of occasions mentioned how the Gospels, and particularly the Gospel of Luke, has weighed heavily upon me. Luke, like the other Gospel writers, but seemingly to me, for whatever reason, uh, I was drawn at a fairly early point in my life after coming to Christ to some of the things contained within the Gospel of Luke related to the difficulty of discipleship and the demands of the Lordship of Christ. Within a few weeks of having been converted, I came to the passage in chapter 9, verse 62, from Jesus Himself. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Those words, and words very similar to those words, have long pierced my heart, and quite honestly at times plagued my very conscience. Today we come to a passage that is as weighty, it is as demanding. It's troubling, to be honest with you. And it should be. Jesus has an encounter with a, a young man who seems to be sincerely pursuing the answer to life's ultimate question. A question that everyone must ask. And I believe everyone does ask. And believe me, all of eternity rests on getting the right answer. He asked of Jesus, as we must ask, what must I do to inherit eternal life? To be sure, everyone has an opinion. But there's only one opinion that will ultimately count throughout all eternity. So let's examine this great question today and to be sure, let us be sure that we, each of us as individuals and as collectively as a church, that we have come to the correct answer. To the correct answer. To the answer that our Lord Jesus gives to us. Read with me beginning in verse 18. And a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said, see, we have left 
our homes and have followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or parents or, or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come. Pray with me, if you will. Father, once again we confess that your word is truth. It is your word. It can only be true. And so, Lord, we ask you today to give us understanding. Admittedly, this is a difficult passage. It is a passage by which we could do great harm if we misunderstand it. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit would be at work. Give me the ability to speak with precision and with clarity, with faithfulness to that which you have said. And give to each of us understanding that we may know that indeed we have eternal life. Bless us as we study today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we come to a story that should be familiar to all of us. It's found in both Matthew and Mark, what we call the three synoptic Gospels. Uh, they are fairly uh, to told in a fairly straightforward way. They're very similar. The, each telling is very similar to the other. And so we come to this with a sense of familiarity. We, we see it here within the, the context of what Luke has done. And there, there's seemingly some continuity, so it, both in terms of um, Luke's writing, that he wants us to see them together, and seemingly... Uh, going all the way back into chapter 17 and verse 20, we, we see these connectors at each of the various episodes, the various pericopes. There's your big word to go look up if you want to a little bit later. But we, we come and we see these ands and also and nows. And so connect these things together. And we, we noted last week that Luke is fond of using irony and contrast to drive home Jesus' point that we will be shocked at those who inhabit the kingdom of, of God. And those that presume that indeed they will and they do inhabit the kingdom of God will be equally shocked on that day when they find out indeed. They are not, they have not been, nor will they ever be citizens of the kingdom established by our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be shocked to hear those words, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. And so in, these, in this particular encounter, this encounter, and we sometimes call it the, the uh, uh, encounter with the rich young ruler, the, 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 young, the young man, different, different ways it is referred to. But we, nor the disciples, get the result that might be expected. And a seemingly eager seeker of salvation, and an, even an admirer of Jesus, walks away ultimately possibly finally, disappointed. I'm reminded of the book that I've so often recommended to you, The Gospel According to Jesus by John MacArthur. And I believe the chapter in which he speaks to this particular text, he calls it Jesus Challenges an Eager Seeker, if I remember correctly. And so, again, Jesus lays down what proves to be an insurmountable challenge to this, uh, for, for this young man. And so, as we come to it, again, a fairly straightforward telling of the events that had transpired, but we're left to ask, 
Why did Jesus treat this man in this way? What does Jesus' explanation of the situation mean? What are the implications of these instructions uh, for us? What are the applications of it as we seek to be faithful to our Lord? How does it apply as we seek to tell others about our Lord Jesus Christ and His gospel and the way of salvation? This encounter is a sober reminder to each and every one of us that that not everyone who has their conscience pricked and their mind unsettled about the realities of life and death in eternity. Just because you're a bit troubled in a moment does not mean that indeed you have or that you will receive this eternal salvation. And so let's get into the text there in verse 18. Simply this ultimate question, the question is asked, by this young man, who if we certainly if we put all of the three accounts together, we know that he is young, he is prominent, he is wealthy, he is influential, he's eager and inquiring. Just the right type of guy that any Southern Baptist preacher would have loved to have walk into his midst and want to sign the card and join the church. In fact, you'd be sure to give that guy a card to make a pledge regarding his tithes as he joined that morning. And so he's everything a prospect should be. In fact, he comes to Jesus and he asks the right question. He asks, what must I do? Now, now, Matthew's account says he says, what good deed? There's some discussion. Is he off of the right track immediately by the way he phrases the question? Does he have a, a works mentality? I'm a really good guy, Jesus. So tell me what other good things must be added to my lengthy track record of good things that I've already done. Is that, is that what's going on here? Possibly or Quite possibly. It's just simply the way somebody would ask the question. We find it throughout the New Testament. Uh, ask of the apostles, what must I do to be saved? What, how do I receive eternal life? How do I respond affirmatively, positively to this gospel that's being presented? This gospel that there is a Savior whose name is Jesus Christ who entered our realm for the sake of our salvation. The young man asked the right question and is certainly related to the right issue, this issue of eternal life, of, of salvation, of citizenship in the kingdom. And certainly, he asked the right person. Who else could or should you ask? Jesus, the one who entered our realm to accomplish our salvation, that, that from all of eternity past, He had been at the very center of the plan of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, through which He would enter this realm to actually accomplish salvation, to die on a cross, so that anyone and everyone who ever believes would indeed be saved. And so He comes to this right person. And he, and he comes at the right time. We've, we've noted a couple of times. Jesus senses the urgency of these moments as he is approaching the time of his crucifixion. It, it seems to me that he is increasingly terse in answering and addressing those who have approach him. Again, back in uh, chapter 9, uh, it, someone said, oh, I'll follow you wherever I, you go. And he, gave, and he gives him that business. Foxes have holes. Birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And again, well, let, let me go bury my father. And he gives him, hey, no man 
having put his hand to the plow. And looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. But here he, he takes time to deal personally and intimately with this young man and his very important question. He comes not only to, to the, with the right question, with the right issue, to the right person at the right time. He comes with the right attitude, seemingly. Mark says he comes and kneels down before the Lord Jesus. He, he is respectful, he is reverent. And again, dre- addressing him as good teacher. He, he is sincere about the question that he asks and sincere at believing that the one he asked the question of could give to him the answer. He was quite sincere regarding his inquiry. I often get into debates. Imagine me doing that. Discussions. Some iron sharpening iron business. And as to whether it's appropriate to invite those that have some interest in the gospel, interest in salvation, desire to be forgiven of their sins, should we invite them to pray, quote-unquote, the sinner's prayer? Should we invite them to pray to receive Christ? But if they're really sincere, if they really, 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 I mean really, mean it. It's all good. Here's the problem. I think most anybody, the highest percentage of those that would respond and inquire in this way, they're sincere. Listen, even the cute girl or the cute guy that shows up at your church or your youth group and they they know, hey, I I, got to get into this church thing, this Jesus thing, or this girl's not going to date me anymore. They are very sincere in wanting to be right with Jesus as long as Jesus gives them the cute girl or the cute guy. They're very sincere. I believe Jesus is the answer to that which is perplexing me right now. He, He is the answer to my problems at work. He is the answer to the problems with my children. He's the answer to the problems with, with my wife. He is, he is the solution to many problems. And I would really like for Him to resolve those problems for me. They're very sincere. Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is deceitful above all things. I think some translations, the heart is desperately wicked. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Let me tell you something. Your own heart is the ultimate traitor. You see things sometimes, well, just, I love your heart. Did I say that right? Is that good? Follow your heart. Follow it straight into hell. If you're following your heart, that is where you will go. Okay? And so, again, he, he was sincere. And, 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 and most people are genuinely sincere. But we must, again, give them the right answer to the sincerely asked question. And so, Jesus engages, beginning in verse 15, with a bit of dialogue with this young man, he asked the diagnostic question or a diagnostic question. I want to know what you're thinking and why you're saying. Why are you talking to me? Why would you come and address me in this particular way? And so he asked the question, why do you call me good? And then the follow-up. And this is the point of the spear, the tip of the arrow, the sharp point of the needle. No one is good except God alone. Either you don't really have an accurate understanding of that which is good, and if that's the case, then I'm the wrong guy to answer answer your question. Or if I am good, then I am God. And you've certainly come to the right person at the right time to ask this 
right question. And so, Jesus begins to probe him a bit there in verse 20. You know the commandments. Now, one of the, in, in apologetics and evangelism, as we're talking to people, many times we try to find points of agreement and, even, and points of disagreement, just so we can kind of define where we are. And so Jesus finds in this young man, a man who shares with Jesus a great many very crucial, very important presuppositions. He knows the commandments and presumably he thinks of them as good and holy and right. A testimony to that which God is or that who God is. A testimony to that which God wills for the life of his people. And so he outlines five particular commands. All of them having to do with their horizontal relationships related to the prohibition on adultery. The command to not murder, to not steal, to not bear false witness, to honor your father and mother. All good. All biblical. But look in verse 21. What does the young man say to the preaching of the law? He displays a very flawed understanding of both the law and of himself. He actually has a very low view of God and of the law. He has a high view of his own merits, his own performance, and he has a diminished view of of what his own sin really was. He failed to recognize that the purpose of the law is to bring conviction and to recognize the reality of guilt and condemnation. It must wound and ultimately kill before it heals. Paul in Romans 7, in in kind of cataloging his relationship uh, to the law, he said, I wouldn't even understand what sin was if it hadn't been for the law. And and then when I came and the Spirit began to work, and I understood what the law was actually saying, saying it killed me. And only in being killed by the law did I have any hope of being made alive in the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ, far being from the attitude of this man, all these I have kept. Paul could only say, O wretched man, O wretched man, not that I was, but that I am. When compared to the infinite and perfect holiness of Almighty God. And that's why we often say, you must be lost before you can be saved. As Spurgeon is quoted as saying, the law is the silver needle of the law that dry, that pulls through the golden thread of the gospel. You hear us sometimes referring to an evangelism type technique called the way of the master. Are you a good person? And here is what, you know, when we think about our culture, our day, Sometimes I think our besetting sin is greed or coveting. Sometimes I think it's issues to do with sexual ethics. But I'm not sure that the besetting sin of our culture is not pride. It's not the reality that indeed I am a, yes, I am a good person. Even when probing, no, no, I've never done that. No, I'm not guilty of this, that, or the other. And so, he fails to recognize. No. No, Jesus. I recognize the law. It's a good thing. And I've failed miserably at every point. And so, Jesus, recognizing exactly where he is, verse 22, he issues to him, what proves to be a very disturbing imperative. Okay, you have obeyed the law. There's there's simply one thing that you lack. And here's what you lack. Go and sell everything that you have and distribute it to the poor, and then you will actually have this eternal life. You will have 
treasure in heaven. And, and, and again, thinking in context, that those shocking revelations of, of, of who is in the kingdom and who is out. We talked about the children last week. Are they trusting? Not always. They're certainly not innocent. And they're dependent. Well, they are. But after my oldest daughter learned to say no, her second words were, my do it. My do it. Okay? Well, well now, here, here's, here's why you have to be like a child to enter the kingdom. You really don't have any possessions, and possessions often possess us. Come with me someday and we can play with my grandchildren. And we'll see about possessiveness. The toys strode all over the floor. One of them's over here playing with this. And the other one comes over here to pick up that one. No, that's mine! I know y'all's children never acted like that. But children have a possessiveness about what they perceive to be theirs. And so, again, Jesus puts his finger on an issue. He, he, offers, he issues to him a command. Remember, no one is good except God. And then if I'm God, you should hear and obey my command. Now, this is unique, what he does with this young man. But it seems entirely consistent with everything we know about the words of Jesus and the gospel itself. It's consistent with deny yourself, take up your cross. And so, let me say it this way at this point. We're going to come back to this. If we are saved, and y'all can all breathe the sigh of relief, and then I'm going to take it away from you in a minute. If we are saved... We have been made willing to do that which God commands. And so, we see here that he hears this command, and then in verse 23, he heard it, he understood it, and he went away, he went away sad, because it was a tragic refusal. Now some would say that if you had done that, he still wouldn't have been saved. God doesn't save anyone on the basis of their philanthropy, of their generosity. That's not a work. But again, Jesus put his finger on a specific issue that pointed to the universal issue. That he didn't understand his own sin and his need of a Savior. Now hear me when I say this. Everything that is not willingly and knowingly placed under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ is by definition sin. Everything about your life that is not conforming to the character of the Lord Jesus Christ is sin. It is a refusal to you. More about that in just a moment. What was his problem? I think James gets at it when he talks about Abraham and his works, his willingness to offer the son Isaac. He summarizes it, faith without works is dead. You cannot have genuine saving faith without it being productive. Any more than you can have a fire without it producing heat. Heat is the natural result of a fire. It's distinct from the fire. Okay? Fire and heat aren't the same things necessarily but they're intrinsic to each other. You cannot have fire without having heat. You can't have faith without having fruit of that faith. Let me, let me illustrate. Take a father. I love my children. I would do anything for my children. I would die for my children. And yet they do not provide for their basic daily needs. They never offer them any tenderness, any love. They never offer them the protection of a, of a safe place to live. They don't provide for their clothing. They don't, they don't provide for their food. But yet he walks around, oh, I love my children. Does that meet any definition that we know of, of love? It does not. In the same th way, faith without fruit meets no definition that the Bible knows of in regards to 
faith. And so, let's look at the explanation now. Verses 24 through 27. Jesus summarizes this, and it doesn't really get any easier. His summary is this, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. I've said this before. Most of us in living in the United States of America by any contemporary or historic standards meet the qualifications of being rich. By worldwide historic standards. We are all wealthy, so that should get our attention. He's, he's uncomfortable. And here's the thing, and, and, and so many times, particularly parents and certainly grandparents, Sunday school teachers, VBS workers, children's camps workers, child evangelism experts, we, we see a child get discomfort, uncomfortable. We see them get squirmy. We see, we see them get uneasy with what's being said. And we very quickly say, well, go to them and, Try to comfort them with this easy believism notion. Well, all you have to do, fill in the blank. Close your eyes, bow your head, raise your hand. I, I see that hand. I see that hand. Yeah. We, we tend to want to comfort them with a, with a false measure of assurance. And so, so many times, this work of God goes deep and takes a certain amount. Of time, And so, we see this young man has, has great difficulty to yield to that which our Lord commands. And so, verse 25, Jesus again summarizes it by illustration, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. It's simply impossible. Now let me add to that. It's impossible for a poor person to enter the kingdom of God as well. That only God can make a camel of any type, a rich camel or a poor camel. It is only God that can thread the eye of that needle. And so we see here, again, verse 26, the young man responds, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, the, the, the disciples run, then, then, then who can be saved. Well, wait a minute. If, if this guy that looks for all the world like one that we would want with us, who can be saved? And Jesus answers again. What is impossible with man is possible with God. It's possible. It is accomplished in the work of the Holy Spirit, in the working of this thing we often refer to called regeneration. When we speak of the sinfulness of man, the, con the lost condition of man, we use the term depravity, sometimes total uh, depravity. And, and there's at least two ga categories we can speak of when we speak of the lost condition. We can speak of that, that which they're unwilling to do. They are unwilling to repent and believe. Why don't they repent and believe? They don't want to. They, they don't want to. And we can also say, that they're unable to do certain things. They're unable to repent and believe. And they go together. They're unable. They're unwilling. They, they, they fit uh, together. He, he won't because he can't. He can't because he won't. Okay? And so we see this young man is unwilling to do that which Christ commanded. And to be sure, there's a certain sense where he has the goods at his disposal. He can liquidate them but he would only be doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. In, in that, that, that ultimately he cannot raise his own dead heart. He, he cannot submit himself to the Lordship of Christ. And as I've argued so many times, we can walk people through all times of, types of religious hoops, but we can't thread the needle for them. We, 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 we can't cause them to surrender to this lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he chose possessions over Christ, to be sure. He chose his sinful, rebellious autonomy over submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. In that book, The Gospel According to Jesus, John MacArthur makes this statement. So often we preach a gospel so simplistic, so watered down that the 
non-elect won't even reject it. Now, hear me. Jesus used obstacles not to discourage the elect. They will come. They will come when they hear the gospel. But it was to not deceive. It was not to not deceive. He was honest, and we should be too. It was to not deceive the non-elect. Well, look at verse 28. Peter interrupts, of course. He's Peter. What else is he supposed to do? Well, wait a minute. We've, we've left everything. I don't know if he's frustrated or bragging. But at any rate, we've left everything. And Jesus speaks to this issue. He says, listen, I know you have. And there's ample reward for you, both here and in the future, in eternity. Now, so what are we to, to, to take away from this? So we must liquidate all to go to heaven, to have eternal life. I've already said it a minute ago. We did, and we do. It's all under His Lordship. I went to my dentist this past week, and he's at the point of retirement. He has sold his business. He no longer owns it, but he is operating. He's running it now for a few more years, making the transition. Not the owner. He's managing. It's kind of like us when we become Christians. We no longer even own ourselves, but we've been entrusted with stewardship of this thing that we call life. And so, we must be willing. Jesus is not here to put His finger on your problem issue. But we must be willing to surrender all. Oh, thank God, Tim. You had me scared. We're, yeah. I'm, I, I, I'm willing. I, I'm willing. Hear this principle. You never know what is genuine until it's tested. Ladies, if you have one, look at that diamond on your finger. Is it real or is it Memorex? Now, I could put one of those little things in my eye. I couldn't tell you. Could be plastic. Could be diamond. You don't know until it's tested. A couple of bills. One of them says it's worth $20. Another one of these bills claims to be worth many times more than that $20. One of them is real. One of them is a fake. This one. This one. Which one would you rather have? The first one or the second one? The one that's what well, says it's worth a whole lot. This one says it's not as much. Well, anybody know? Anybody want to pick? Now, any of you, now some, maybe some of these eagle-eyed young people can tell from where they're sitting, but those of you that aren't eagle-eyed young people may have a little more difficult time. Anybody need these? We assume that the money we're carrying in our wallet is genuine. We just operate on that. But do you know beyond all scientific mathematical doubt that every bill in your wallet is the real thing? Are you willing to bet your life on it? Is it possible that it's ingenuine? That it's actually a counterfeit? Now this, if I handed it to you, most everybody here would figure out in just a moment which one's the real thing and which one is the counterfeit. But you only know by what? By testing. By proving that which is genuine. Let me give you another example. I've always said that I would serve my country if called. I had, when I was 18 years old, I had to sign up for, they call it selective service, sign up for the draft. The draft had already ended. The Vietnam War was over. It, they were no longer drafting, but I had to sign up. And I know, and I believe to this day, had I been called up, I would have gone. But let me probe a little deeper. Had I been in one of those landing craft, June 6, 1944, as they traveled across the English Channel from England to France, and when that ramp dropped and splashed 
into the English Channel. And a wall of bullets came in to that landing craft. And I began to see body parts and blood splattered all around me. Would I have advanced? Or would I have crawled under one of those seats and curled up in a fetal position and called Mama? I don't know. I hope I would have been courageous. I would like to think that I would have fought even unto death. But the thing is, it's never been tested, and ultimately, I do not know. And for most of us sitting here today, the problem is, our faith has not gen- genuinely and ultimately tested. We haven't been da- asked to, or commanded to bow down before a, before a Muslim ter- terrorist and said, deny Christ, or I'll cut your head off. But there are people in the world today that are being asked that question. We can sit here in our comfort and very confidently say, oh, I I would be willing. I would be willing. Would you? I don't think any one of us here can say, I know when the gate on that landing craft dropped, I would have been the first one out charging that beach at Normandy. Do you know? Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself daily to see whether you are the faith. Test yourself. Daka. Mazzetti. It's an imperative. Dokamos is a word that occurs all through the Bible, basically meaning to, to test, to prove, to see if something is genuine. Peter uses the word when he talks about the fiery trial, trials of life that are testing your faith to see if it's genuine. All of the providence of, of life, believer or unbeliever, are designed by God to test you to reveal exactly where you, what you are. There's no reason for anyone to step into eternity unprepared because God is showing it to you each and every day. Oh, I would sell everything, preacher. How about your right to be angry? How about your right to hold a grudge against somebody? How about you how about you're being unwilling to reconcile with someone what about your ownership of your right to be unchristlike all of life is pressing upon you to prove what that your faith is genuine that it is dokamos that is the real thing it's not a counterfeit scrutinize your life paul says examine it daily to see if you're of the faith i mentioned a good test a few weeks back galatians 5 uh, following, you can see, here's the works of the flesh, here's the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? Examine yourself. Here's another one. 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind. I'll stop right there. That's enough for the rest of your life. Right? Examine yourself. No, I don't have to be loving. I don't have to be kind. You know, you know all of us sin, Brother Tim. Right? We all sin. Thank God I've got a Savior. That's why I need a Savior. If you can be that flippant about your sin. Oh, well, you know, we we, we all sin. The heart's desperately wicked. It is the greatest traitor you ever know. You remember when Jesus restored the Apostle Peter there after his resurrection? Kind of a threefold quiz. Lovest thou thee more than these? Thought I'd get a little King James in there before we went home today. Lovest thou your pride? It's not just your possessions. We'll include that. But do do you love your hostility? Do you love your anger? Do you love your unforgiveness? Do you love your lack of kindness? Do you love your unlovingness? Do you love all of those things more than you love Jesus? Test yourself. No matter what you say, God has prepared all the providences of this life. Not only to refine you, and they do, but they test you to see if you're genuine. So don't puff at you, well, I know, I would have sold everything. I sure would. Would you? Would you? Are you still holding on to your right to possess that which is unlike the character of Christ? Lovest thou 
those things more than the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Examine yourself daily to see if you are indeed of the faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your truth, a truth that we believe is sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it divides the joints and the marrow. That, that means that when we come under the scrutiny of the Word of God, we have no place to hide. We have no excuses. That, that you're probing, just as Jesus probed the heart of this young ruler and put his finger on that which stood between him and the kingdom of God. While Jesus is not walking among us, we can't approach him physically. He, through His Word, His Spirit, and the providences of our life, He is daily, He is daily showing who we really are. For those who know Him, they, their faith is being not only refined, but it is being proved. And for those that fail the test, if they're honest, it's pointing out the truth. It's pointing out the truth of who they are and where they stand. God, I pray that today that you would thread the eye of that needle. We're thankful that that which we cannot do and will not do in and of ourselves, that you're able to do. That you thread us through that needle and through that needle we enter your kingdom and eternal life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.